so we are looking at uh, the abolition of man and the third chapter of the abolition of man at that, which is uh, titled the abolition of man. So the book's called that, but the lecture was originally titled the abolition of man and it follows on from what he said in the previous two lectures. I was thinking about it afterwards and uh, what he didn't say and what I would like to have said in, if I had been him and, or if I had delivered that lecture in the context of this classroom and I, I would have said a few things in addition, I'm, I'll mention those, but I was walking by Dr. Noel's door um, he, there was a, somebody that wrote down, it was a sort of a, maybe it was a mantra of his, his mantra was to teach believers to think and thinkers to believe. And I don't think you can teach thinkers to believe. I don't think it's, you can be in the sense that it's a cognitive process alone. But I do think that I can teach believers to think. It's the sort of classical uh, Christian take that you believe in order that you might understand. Uh, belief precedes uh, knowledge in the sense. Not that there's nothing of your previous knowledge that applies. It's not like you couldn't think before you became a Christian, but you have to apply Romans 12 uh, verses 1 and 2 to no, no longer be conformed to the pattern of this world, but rather be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Right? So you need to, if you've come to the faith um, as an adult Christian, or you grew up as a Christian, but you weren't really thinking like a Christian because your church was actually not very good on that front. Uh, you're going to have to learn to think in Christian categories. That's what we're here to do at university, at least. That's what we're endeavoring to do. And uh, so it's my mantra as well, actually, and I've liked it, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that as from uh, Dr. Noel and adopt it myself. I've already followed it, but I like the way it's put. But what Lewis did not put in the first chapter, Men Without Chests, was the Christian implications of this. He's talking about the educational implications. He is talking about the, he is about to talk about the whole societal implications of handing over education to people that are no longer constrained by morality or aesthetics to people who are men without chests. He calls them the conditioners. And he talks about that repeatedly in his works. He refers to these people he calls the conditioners. And what does he mean by that? Well, he ties it very much with progressive education. But what does he leave out? Well, what he leaves out is, is um, it struck me, uh, I needed to discuss, which is that the Apostle Paul's argument in Romans 1 and 2 that um, those who are pagans, and he's speaking to a pagan audience, it's the, the epistle to the Romans, right? Um, know that God exists. They know, and therefore they're without excuse because he can be known by reason of the things as they have been made. They simply do know it, and they deny it. They reject the truth and unrighteousness. And so he gives them over to all sorts of other things. That's, that's the gist of Romans 15 uh, to 31 and so forth. They know, and yet they deny it. They reject it in unrighteousness. And there's a, a book that came out recently by a, an atheist by the name of David Berlinski, uh, The Devil's Delusion, Atheism and Its Scientific Pretensions, in which he argues that uh, modern science um, and particularly the atheists among them um, are very happy to recite a periodic table but they don't go far as reasoning when it comes to anything weightier. They don't get very far. It's embarrassing. And he pushes it as a uh, non-theist and observes how absurd the scientific assertions are on a wide variety of issues. Remember this is a, this is what it would be called a uh, normally from a Christian vantage point, a hostile witness, right? It's not like he's sympathetic to Christianity, but he's arguing that theism is entirely rational. And to say that it isn't rational is irrational is just propaganda. And he's saying that, and he, he can just simply think, that's right, so, but he's being truthful there. That's very interesting to me. 
Um, that's one of the implications of this, is that people lose the capacity to discern even uh, basic truths from falsehoods. But Romans 1 is saying something more than that, because Paul is making the case that everyone implicitly acknowledges God. Or even explicitly, he can see it because they're polytheists. Right? We're going to come to this a uh, little bit not too far down the road when we look to De Descriptione Temporum, this lecture that Lewis gives when he becomes um, installed as the chair of medieval and renaissance studies at Cambridge University. He argues that in the mid-19th century, a break happens, which is so seismic it's hard to know how to describe it, because he says the ancient world, that is the pagan world and the Christian world, have more in common than do our contemporaries men without chests, and Christians and, and pagans. The pagans and Christians are over here. Our contemporaries, it's hard to find what category they fit under. And when I say our contemporaries, I'm talking about our world right now. Including everyone in the room, this is how you were educated probably. You, you had it, a certain worldview that you, were, you had been taught, which really denied what Paul says is obvious. You denied that you were taught to deny the obvious, that God is the creator. And yet every major religion, he's just argued in the Tao, and even minor religions will revere the creator. They're involved and they acknowledge this. There are religious rites, there are certain taboos and sanctities. That's what he's demonstrated in chapter two, the Tao. He talks about very, it's not just that they do worship, but there are very clear patterns of agreement amongst the various religions, however much they disagree with one another, they do agree on this. This is just bedrock, of course, how else could it be? Except, he notes that his contemporaries in education are denying that reality, and with that they're denying Romans 1 and 2. So now we come to a problem in the church with presenting the gospel, because they can't assume what the Apostle Paul assumed of his audience, that they understood what later uh, theologians will call common grace. They deny common grace, in fact. They reject it wholly. They've, they've rejected the sacrament, sacramental nature of reality. Even the world, they never mind God, they reject the idea that creation is in some sense miraculous and has an origin, has an author, has an end, and the end is designed by the author, etc. They even deny um, intelligent design, which any scientist is going to affirm. Any scientist worth his salt is going to affirm. And that's the state that we're in. And he's going to want to trace the implications of this. And I'm going to get to this because it has a very recent contemporary application as well. Very recent contemporary application. But think about this, for science to be science, we have to have a determined reality. That is, is something that it has norms and laws and regulations because otherwise we can't call it knowledge. So determinism is a prerequisite of all science, a deterministic universe. And that includes psychology, by the way. This is a quote, the alternative is not free will, but indeterminism. If you deny determinism, you, you affirm not free will, you, you affirm indeterminism. There is, in other words, chaos. Reality is chaotic. It has no design, it has no purpose, it has no meaning, it has no stability, it has no order, it has no norms. So what we call free will, in the old way of looking at things, Lewis is going to depend on this, Christian, Christians will advance the idea of being free in Christ, the freedom of the gospel. Uh, they'll just say this is a subjective feeling, it's not a, a real thing. And they will deny that freedom is, is something that needs to be protected, as we see in like our Charter of Rights and so forth, right? Those sorts of 
freedoms. I, I don't need to get it. It's not, I don't mean this to be a political statement. It's an illustration. <laughs> and they'll say it's more of an inner sense of freedom so that even then conscience. But they'll deny conscience as having any objective validity then as well. It doesn't really matter what your conscience says because that thing that you call conscience isn't a real thing either because your conscience is a sense of right and wrong in the universe and there is no objective correlate to what you feel is right and wrong. So we can deny conscience then. That means we can deny personal ethics as well as objective ethics. That means <laughs> that all norms for ethics also fall and are moot. And by this, I will be referring to contemporary practices of denying the Nuremberg Code. Well, I'll come to that in a second. But they will say that free will is a subjective feeling and it's better called mm, inner feeling, inner freedom. And that depends on how integrated our personalities are. So what we want to do is determine as psychologists then how we can um, get the patient to feel a sense of freedom without actually having a sense of freedom. And psychologist, to put it in a nutshell, does it by eliminating all sense of conflict within the person. So any sense of moral conflict that you have or distress, we'll just say that those are not real things that you're feeling. That will remove the sense of conflict. You won't be distressed anymore by what's going on around you because that's not real. So we'll free you from the a sense that your freedom is important. We'll free you from that. Call it liberation. But look at what it does to science. Because science is de dependent on fixed laws, determinism, things that can be observed, replicated, and universally without any sense of bias uh, affirmed, right? That's empiricist science. That we're, if we're gonna call anything, and if we're gonna appeal to truth, we have to depend on that fixity because if the world is arbitrary and indeterminate, then science means nothing. And you will note that in our contemporaries, that is exactly what is being affirmed in science, by the way. Even mathematics is gendered or racist or whatever, right? It, it's it's uh, being normed by some other experience. So it's not universal. It's not objective. You've heard these claims. I'm not going to address the claims specifically because I have no interest in doing that. I'm just making the point that science now talks about these things and educators accept them into the classroom. And this pushes those who are uh, evolutionists, like Jordan Peterson, by the way, into a real con sense of conflict, because evolution depends on some somehow that everything arose out of chance, indeterminism, chaos, right, just by chance. And at the same time, they require a sense of objectivity to call itself science, right? They say, well, evolution is fact, it's science. But evolution is, is radically indeterministic, it's chaotic. You can't have it as science if its root is in indeterminism. It just doesn't work. So let me give you an illustration. Um, when I'm speaking here, I'm making an argument, I'm reasoning, I'm appealing to something. When I'm appealing to uh, an, uh, an argument or making an argument and using logic and you think that it makes sense, does the fact that it seems to make sense actually make sense, or is it just a biochemical response that you have, a feeling that it's right, but not actually that it's right? Is it just a feeling that it's right, but not an actual, this is correct, this is true, or this is just? Lewis is going to talk about this in, when we come to mere Christianity, the sense of justice as a real thing, an indisputable, thing that every child knows from early on when they sense, say that's not fair you took my toy that's not fair why do you say to a, another child that's not fair because you know that that other child knows what fairness is you don't have to argue it they don't have to have a debate about whether fairness actually exists or not they're angry because an injustice has been done because they know that's the way things are even small children know this but educated adults scientists deny it that's the state of the academy that's the state of his problem there. So he, he is introducing us to a significant problem in the 20th and 21st century, and it is going to mark his whole literary corpus 
as well as his Christian apologetics, as well as his literary theory, because when he gets into it, he's going to talk about the medieval and Renaissance periods as having a common worldview, which more or less holds till the mid-19th century, and then it gets set aside by modern science. And what happens as a result of that? That's what he's going to look at. I looked at it in my own doctorate, actually. I was, cons before I read The Abolition of Man, I had realized that even though I didn't want to study romantic literature, that it was important that I was doing so and that it was a sort of a decisive period. It is a decisive period in my mind. Um, it's not my favorite period of literature. Usually when you expect somebody to be teaching the subjects because they most love the thing that they're studying, right? That was not the case with me. I thought, although I think there's, it's, there's something important here, I think they're almost always wrong. Almost always wrong. <laughs> this is, and this is the exact same time, so in a literary movement, poetry, where we observe something else happening, which is modern hermeneutics under Friedrich Schleiermacher, which is a way of interpreting the poetry. So the poetry presents a reality, the hermeneutics interprets the reality, they arise concurrently. I think that they're both wrong, and in the same way, from opposite sides of the coin, and the one arises to justify the other. So modern theology begins in the early 19th century. It really takes hold, however, in the mid-19th century. And the humanities get replaced by the human sciences with a different purpose and a different methodology. As again, I, I wrote on this. But what led me to this, now I'm gonna talk more personally than I normally do, and then I'm gonna to come to this text because this is a very important text. What came, what led me to this path in life? When you look, um, in your own life, providentially, you see backwards with a little bit more clarity than you do looking forwards. To say that's putting it mildly. Looking forwards, it's not clear what you're supposed to do. Looking backwards, it's, it's easier to see why what happened happened when it happened. For me, as an undergraduate, I read a uh, writer in my modern history class called Hannah Arendt. Have you heard of this woman? Jewish? German? Philosopher? When I say philosopher, she studied, studied under Martin Heidegger, the most important German philosopher of the 20th century. Um, also with Karl Jasper, one of the most important psychologists of the 20th century. There are all sorts of problems here, which I don't need to go into, but um, very briefly, Heidegger, uh, was important for the Nazis because he was the rector of the university. He ended up being the rector and early on in, um, supported Nazism. And um, this was a problem for Hannah Arendt because she's Jewish. Secondly, it's a problem because they had an affair. So now, <laughs> and so she ended up having to flee Germany and she spent her life reflecting on all manner of things, just a fascinating thinker. I, I wrote the second chapter of my doctoral thesis uh, on her and confronting this situation. But I read and wrote a paper on a book that she wrote called Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil. Context, Adolf Eichmann was the architect, as in the chief bureaucrat tasked with bringing about the final solution. The final solution is uh, to send the Jews to the death camps in, in the East, whether in Germany or Poland or whatever. That's the final solution. Leading up to that point, there were different ways of dealing with the Jewish problem. By the way, the, the, the Nazis were not national um, nationalists. They were biologists. They had a biological view of human nature. It was a very scientific view of human nature. It wasn't that they thought that the Germans were the master race. They thought the master race was going to come about and the Germans needed to acknowledge them. And if they didn't, then the Germans too could be set aside. That's, and the Jews themselves were seen as a virus, by the way. That's the language used. 
I've written about this in the Epoch Times, the Jews were regarded as a virus on the people of Europe. And to have a healthy society that would lead to this sort of humanity which the Germans wanted to bring out, they had to cure the virus. How do you cure the virus? They had plans to get them out, ship them to Madagascar. If you ever played Risk, that little island off the south, east of uh, uh, Africa. Not a very little island, but that was the plan, send them to Madagascar. Eichmann was on board because he was a Zionist. He'd read uh, Theodor Herzl's Der Judenstaat. Sorry, I'll stop speaking German. Theodor Herzl's The Jewish State. Remember, the modern Jewish state does not begin until 1947. Israel. This is a 19th century document. Adolf uh, Eichmann sees how badly the Jews have been treated uh, in European history and agrees that they need to be given a state of their own. That will solve the problem. So he's committed to that. When the Allies come up through Italy in 1943, that's not gonna happen anymore. They can't go across the Mediterranean, however bizarre that uh, project was or how realizable, that doesn't matter. They can't do that and so they move towards, well, what are we gonna do then? And as they start losing the war, they become more determined that they have to fix the bigger problem. The biggest problem is not winning the war. The biggest problem is curing the patient from the virus. So they exterminate. And he is the bureaucrat that, that is tasked with taking that, uh, executing that. So he's a terrific bureaucrat. It's called a report. Hannah Arendt, Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil. She says that Eichmann was not a devil. He was a bureaucrat. He was not this, you know, you would have thought the man who's doing all this would be super evil. She said, actually, he's an unimpressive bureaucrat. He's just a very good bureaucrat. He's very good at what he does. Very good at, at, at uh, setting things in order and making things run on time, etc." But actually, he has no particular hatred of the Jews. Eichmann is on trial in Jerusalem. He was captured in uh, Argentina and brought there for a show trial. Got, you can see that, you can see, uh, go to YouTube. He's behind glass. They're worried somebody's gonna try and kill him before bulletproof glass, he's up there and he's there. And, um, and so you can watch it if you want. Um, but her sense, and she wrote this up for the New York Post because at this time she's now living in Germany, in, in, the US, she says that actually the, the Jewish, uh, as, in, as the Israelis are missing the point here, he is not this snarling demon and the real problem here is not an evil man but the banality of evil. It's just there in the institutions. The institutions carried this out without any real hostility on the part of those who are involved in the machine. The bureaucrats. The scientists, were they really that bad as people? She would probably say no, they weren't that bad. And yet, she's also going to say they have done an evil which almost beggars description. So she's not denying the, the evil, she's saying that they themselves are cogs in a machine. So now she's talking about something very different. So there's my entry point into Hannah Arendt. I go to Germany after my PhD after my uh, undergrad studies. I studied German, I studied classics. The man who taught me classics mentions Hannah Arendt. My ears prick up, because I studied also her, her uh, document, um, The Origins of Totalitarianism at the time. So I'm already interested. He talks about the human condition, et cetera, Hannah Arendt. I thought, okay, I gotta, I gotta look up this further. That pushed me down this path of seeing a problem in the 20th century that had not existed before. Everyone recognizes the atrocity of the Holocaust. And uh, there are ways of seeing it, and I think it's important to see the nature of what went wrong there. And I don't, and my, I was convinced, I'm not a Christian by the way at this point, in Germany or in Canada, of the need to see it right in order to not get it wrong. Because what Arendt is arguing is that totalitarianism is not characteristic of Nazi Germany and communist Russia. It's characteristic of advanced societies everywhere. I wrote, read this book a few years back, 
by Neil Postman called Technopoly. I'm going to look at this sometime. He's talking about the United States. This was written 30 years ago. If you read this now, it looks like it was written yesterday, other than he doesn't mention COVID. But, right? but he, the, the things that he observes there, um, the attempt, the surrender of culture to technology is, that, is the subtitle of his book, is the belief that technology is going to deliver us from the problems of life. The belief in technology, which Lewis says is characteristic of the 19th century as well. The belief that machines will prevent atrocities, will make life better, which he regards as a sort of fallacy, which is so universally held that they don't, people don't even question it. Why do people get the latest iPhones when they come out? Why do we think that the latest app or social media thing is going to advance our lives in any way, shape, or form? Why do we think that that is the case? Uh, why do we believe that the past is something that no, over, no longer teaches us anything about the present? It's because of the technological fallacy, which is this, that my iPhone now, which is very good, and uses the latest operating system, functions because of that, this is not the newest, by the way, and anything like it, it's like, but it works, it is way better than the one I had 10 years ago, which is a brick, all right? Can't you be, and the assumption is that so with technology, so also with all other forms of knowledge. We don't need to get at the root of these things because basically we live in an indeterminate reality which we can make malleable and do our will as masters of the technology. Right? Everyone, and as somebody who lectures on Tolkien as well as Lewis, think about the, pal the palantir, the seeing stones. Think about the function of, of, of uh, Galadriel's mirror and so forth. What do they allow you to do? Well, this is a, like, I have a seeing stone in my pocket which allows me to see somebody on the other side of the world. It doesn't allow me to see into the future, but it does allow me to see somebody virtually on the other side of the planet. This is miraculous technology, and it's something that I certainly couldn't do 10 years ago, even five years ago. And, and it feeds the belief in technology, and we're devoted to technology, and Lewis's observation in Tolkien's is that we believe in technology the way that um, in the Renaissance, they believed in magic. And in scripture, they believed in witchcraft, which is that it's gonna save us and we can just get, if we just are more devout and, and more committed to the technology, it will allow us to solve any problem. That's what happened under COVID, by the way, which was decided by the science of algorithms the, the statistics were connected to early projections, computer projections of what the outcome of that might be. I'm not diminishing or saying, by the way, that there's no COVID, in case you're worried, I'm not going to say anything like that. What I am saying is that the science, the appeal to science and to a technological assessment of what the problem was is characteristic of a problem, which at its heart, involves the abolition of man. And so Lewis talks about this. I'm going to come back to this um, Hannah Arendt in a second. But we can see that this is a concern that you will see throughout modern culture. So think about the matrix, the fear of machines becoming human, or us being involved in a machine and not being able to distinguish between the reality machine delivered and our life outside of it. You're sort of plugged in, all that sort of stuff. Uh, we're controlled by this. This is a new form of anxiety. Also, you will see that people are becoming more machine-like. You can implant things into your flesh, including uploading your thoughts into the internet. This is what I'm going to call, this is for another course, and I do deal with it in another course, post-humanism. So if the problem here is the abolition of man, uh, what will come in its place but 
post-humanism. And what's post-humanism is going to preside over what it replaced, which is humanism. And the way it proceeds is to say that there is nothing distinctively human. That thing that we used to see as the center of education, the moral nature of humanity, which distinguished us from the animals, for instance. Dogs are not bad. Even if they bite you, it's not a bad dog. It's not morally bad. It hasn't transgressed any law, per se. It didn't make a judgment and decide and make an error there and need to be put down because it's a bad dog. You can say bad dog, but you're anthropomorphizing the dog. Right? It's not a bad dog. You might have to deal with it, but it, you, nobody really thinks that it, dogs are good and bad. They, they're trained to become that, perhaps. But we don't actually think they have the capacity of goodness. They can be trained to that in some ways, but not, not in the same way. Whereas people, we would say that the capacity for good and evil, in, even so far as judging that God is the creator, is a distinctive mark of human beings. And Paul says that in Romans 1 and 2. That's why they're without excuse, right? That's the very reason. If we reject the idea that we have moral, a moral nature, then we reject the whole basis of Paul's argument, in which case we don't need special grace either. You deny common grace, you see no need for special grace. This is the problem the church faces. It has an educated populace who have been taught to deny common grace. No? See? You see what I'm saying at least. Okay, so if we get rid of that humanity by hollowing out its chest, to use Lewis's phrasing, and there is no moral nature there, which sees the good and directs us towards the good, like justice. Right? Sees injustice, go back to the argument about fairness. Fairness is a species of justice. That's not fair, that's not just. That's my toy, you just took it from me. That's not fair. I'm, I'm not just making a claim, I'm angry about it as well. Why am I angry? Because it's not just. It's not right to do that, I acknowledge it. It's everywhere there. You're telling the child that their feelings about the injustice are false. You have to teach a child very hard that their feelings about justice are t not just misplaced, but totally false. You have to work really hard. No child will believe it, by the way. You have to be super educated to believe that you're beyond good and evil. The more educated you are, the, the less aware you are of this thing, which even small children have which is why it needs to be taught to small children if they're going to be consistent with it, which is why they go into the public education system and try and inculcate it. But what will post-humanism be? Well, it will be the, uh, the removal of the barrier or the distinction, not the barrier, the distinction between a human being and an animal and even a human being from a computer or a human being from the trees. And so you can advance the idea that the planet has rights that we're violating and anthropomorphize the planet and talk about it as an injustice and be willing to sacrifice human beings, let them all starve, whatever, to save the planet, because the planet has rights equal and indistinguishable from the human beings on it, right? And therefore, you're not going to want to have children because that would be producing carbon footprints that will desecrate the earth, and the earth is just as sacred as you are. Have you not heard varieties of this argument? These are all what I call post-humanist arguments. They deny that there is such a thing as the human which is distinct and has certain obligations and certain laws and rules. If you buy this, then you're also going to buy the argument that the solutions that could and should be used to rectify the injustice can include mass deaths. Adolf Eichmann proved that. It wasn't because he was a terrible, terribly evil man. He was effectively, although Hannah Arendt doesn't say it, he was a man without a chest. 
That's what he was. He was that. And we're surrounded by it right now. That's, that's why this hits. And I don't even need to use COVID to illustrate it. It's just that it, it really brings it to attention when you think about trust the science, right? You start saying, oh, well, doesn't science have certain, you know, doesn't uh, like the, uh, one of the basic tenets of science that it has to be possible to contradict it, the falsibility hypothesis, doesn't that, isn't that basic to modern science? Karl Popper says it is. Uh, but we never heard that. It has to be falsifiable. Well, how are you going to test that? Well, you're going to have to do experiments in which you're going to have a, a placebo group or, or a, you know, a group that isn't subjected to the same things and see what happens to them and then see what happens to the ones that you give this to. One gets a sugar cube, the other gets the medicine. What happens to the, the varying, like, what's the difference there? Or you have to be able to falsify it in order for it to be called scientific. Did that happen under COVID? Absolutely not. Right? Yes? I want to circle back a little bit. You made the statement about the humanities have been replaced by the human sciences. Yes. Uh, I definitely see you kind of circling. But is this I'm doing a lot of circling here. <laughs> yeah. Is this the beginning? Is that phrase that you made, is that the beginning of the circular logic argument? I think so. That's what I argued in my doctoral thesis. Yeah. Yes. And that's where a lot of this, the, the, the presuppositions of, of modern science, when I say modern science, I'm not talking modern science in the Royal Society. I am talking about it post 19th century where it starts to become something very different. And, sp and specifically, it applies science to human beings, Perfect. which it had, it had not done so before. It had applied it to the inanimate world it had used the natural world and tried to find its origins and how its secret laws and so forth. Come the 19th century in the human sciences, we decided to apply the scientific method to people and believed that it would deliver to us the same sort of precision and objectivity which we found it did in the realm of the, of the natural world, so-called. It never had divinity of its sense that it bears the Imago Dei and that it is in some sense sacrilegious to apply uh, to a person who bears the image of God a uh, methodology which will te treat him as no different than a tree. So that's part of it. The other part of it is actually just simply the logical impossibility of, an, of being the subject and the object of an experiment at the one and the same time. So when I look at you as my scientific study, I'm looking at another human being. I realize that I'm dealing with somebody who's different than me, yes. But are you not also the same as me? You have to be for it to be scientific. There has to be that consistency, right? Because otherwise, like it's, so I assume that. At the same time, when I say that, uh, by looking at, y at you, I'm also looking at me. So you, the subject of my experiment there, or the object of my experiment, I'm actually implied in the whole process. So it's like trying to jump over your own shadow. <laughs> Try it sometime, right? Because the shadow's there, I can see the shadow. I'm gonna pin it down, I'm gonna jump on it, and then it, yeah, I find it moves. Well, that's because I, even though I'm distinct from that, I'm still participating in that common humanity and I can't do it with the, the, the distance required for it to attain that objectivity which we see in things that aren't like us. So I can look at studies of the earth, like studies of the trees and the water and those sorts, of, I can study those things with reasonable objectivity and with imp relative impartiality, although I don't think it's wholly impartial, but with respect to human beings, I'm always involved in moral judgments because I am a moral being. And the person who I see in front of me who's sick, I may want to help them, but I may also secretly despise them. And I can't help myself because I'm a moral being and that's part of the process. Modern science, the human sciences, never are able to solve the problem of human nature which is brought into the whole mix. 
So scientists do experiments on people hereafter, most obviously in the eugenics movement, happening in Nazi Germany right while Lewis gives this paper and it was heard that it was happening. Well, he didn't need that because he knew they were doing it in Britain as well. And in the US and in Canada, eugenics, father of Canadian modern medicine. Who's that? Tommy Douglas, NDP hero. Yes, he was a eugenicist. Makes it sound, him sound nasty. And maybe he was in, in the sense, not as a person, but in the sense that he was applying eugenics to people and I think it is deeply, deeply problematic. They would tend, and, and in the Duplessis case in, in Quebec, they take orphans and they experiment on them. Because they're orphans, we'll see what happens. We'll do the, the uh, experiments done by the CAA, CIA here uh, on people, psychological experiments. Now the, the, the sort of the red line of Preventing this is called the Nuremberg Code. Informed consent, right? And you can look up the Nuremberg Code, but it arises after Nazi Germany. And every scientist, at least in the social sciences, I've called them the human sciences, but it's just, roughly speaking the same thing, will agree with the Nuremberg Code and agree to abide by it. And they will do it very rigorously. So my colleagues here will ask you if they're in psychology or sociology or whatever, you have to sign a waiver form that you consent to what's about to happen. There's certain, and, and, and here's what could happen to you. Okay, all of those things. But you have to be informed about it and you have to cons agree to it without coercion with in order for this to happen with any sort of ethical validity. And they're, so they're aware of the importance of ethics. Did that happen under COVID? No, absolutely not. not. Not even approaching it. It was waived, disregarded, rejected as having no purchase because it was a crisis. It was a crisis. So we could, we could set aside our ethics because we had to save people because we had, saving people is a good thing. Go save people from the virus. Who did we sound like? Nazis. They are also saving people from the virus. Those are just Jews. Now it's, it is a virus. But still, do the ethics not apply to people? Sure. Do I have a right to violate somebody's informed consent just because I'm afraid? If you do, what sort of person are you? Well, you're a person without a chest. I don't mean you're gutless. I mean that you've waived moral, I mean, might be gutless, but that's, I, you've waived moral realities about human nature as being things that you must abide by. And there's no room for negotiation on this. These are absolutes because this is how the science is to operate going forward. Well, it doesn't anymore. Serious problem, as you can see. We're in the midst of that problem, by the way. It, it, it's not resolved, even if we open up again, I think so, but how about all the people that made these decisions, were coerced, etc., in various ways? What is the fallout of that? Will people ever trust science to do the right thing ever again? How would they do that? What are the conditions for it? This is, I was an early outspoken critic in part because I said, if you do these things, the consequences for public health are enormous. You will not be trusted going forward. You're gonna, and it's not people who are, uh, what do they call them, deniers. Sounds like you're denying the Holocaust, right? It's a terrible phrase. Or, or as if you're unscientific, it's like, no, there's a, there's a methodology which you said you, you actually were sworn to uphold to and, and always did up until this point. Now you've jettisoned it, saying that it was the, the most important aspect of your practice, and now it's not something that you care about anymore. Like, how am I to trust you anymore? Um, this is not a new tale, this is an old tale, tyrannical rulers uh, using fear as a tool of control. It's not, it, this is not new, this is not Nazi, this is historic. It's always been a means of manipulation to get political outcomes. That just begs the question of why this would happen here 
that's not what this class is about i can tell you that i'm i have a very clear idea of why that is so but it's not for this class for this class is to talk about what happens in science fiction what happens in lewis's fiction what he talks about here in the abolition of man which is scientists being empowered to deal with the problems of human nature but who is to trust the scientists So what, is, what does he say here? Let me uh, come to the phrase. It's on the screen behind you, but I'll read the one in front of me. Man's conquest of nature is an expression often used to describe the progress of applied science. Man has nature whacked, said someone to a friend of mine not long ago. In their context, the words had a certain tragic beauty, for the speaker was dying of tuberculosis. No matter, he said, I know I'm one of the casualties. Of course there are casualties on the winning as well as on the losing side, but that doesn't alter the fact that it is winning. So they're happy because science is making progress and that one day we'll have cancer beat. Or one day we'll get rid of the problem of the virus, whatever, like fill in. I have chosen this story as my point of departure in order to make it clear that I do not wish to disparage all that is really beneficial in the process described as man's conquest, much less all the real devotion and self-sacrifice that has gone to make it possible. But, having done so, I must proceed to analyze this conception a little bit more closely. In what sense is man the possessor of increasing power over nature? Because this is the question. In what sense is man the possessor of that power over nature? Because that's the claim. We're emancipating ourselves from nature. Can we detach ourselves, gain power over nature without losing our sense of ourselves? That's where he's going with it. Is it possible to jump over your shadow and yet remain yourself? Is it possible to be a man without a chest and still be a man? Is it possible for education to happen without moral teaching, without education being anything other than propaganda and unscientific at that? His answers are quite clear, but let's consider three examples, the airplane, the wireless, and the contraceptive. Um, I'm gonna skip over this. and come to uh, a little bit further on here. He says, it is of course commonplace to complain that men have hitherto used badly and against their fellows the powers that science has given them. Think of Dr. Frankenstein. I study that here uh, as a tale, sort of a cautionary tale. It's funny when that arises. By the way, horror fiction, science fiction, just happens to come into our culture in the 19th century. Why would that be? It's not by accident, right? Suddenly, this scenario, why is zombie fiction? Drac why Dracula, early 19th century, Frank said, why is that suddenly appearing? Why is sci-fi suddenly appearing? Why is this a, a nightmare scenario? A nightmare scenario which only feels terrifying because we recognize that it is somehow about our situation as well, right? That's why it has its horror. He says, I'm not talking about the abuse of science. That is not the point I'm trying to make. I'm speaking of a particular corruptions and abuses which an increase of moral virtue would cure. I'm not speaking about something. All we need to do is be better people. I am considering what the thing called man's power over nature must always and essentially be. No doubt the picture could be modified by public ownership of raw materials and factories and public control of scientific research. That's what's happening in Canada, by the way. They just, the public, the, that is the government has taken control over the universities. They don't, act, they're no longer independent, the government. And we, we have the public ownership. This is the NDP solution to the problem that we see here, by the way. And it's a smart solution. It's just not effective, but it's smart. It's, they see a problem, here's the way we uh, get rid of individual faults. We just upload it to the bureaucracy. And then we get rid of the problem of individuals making bad decisions because they don't like people. Right? I know that person, I don't like them, I'm gonna abuse them, et cetera. Well, now we don't know these patients, they just walk into our clinic and we have processes. The, bureau the bureaucrats will take over. The solution is more bureaucracy. But unless we have a world state, this will still mean the power of one nation over others. Well, now we do have that, we're moving towards that. So we've got rid of even the national problem there. 
although that's what the fight in the ukraine is about right now i think it's something about that a national state saying no we're not going to give way to that on that front but anyway and even within the world state or the nation it will mean in principle the power of majorities over minorities and in the concrete of a government over the people and all long term exercises of power especially in breeding must mean the power of the earlier generations over later ones why does he say that because that's what contraception means birth control it's the control of the future by the present it, it, people don't usually think of it that way but like the power i'm giving to myself to stop contraception from taking place is a power over a future generation that does not yet exist but would exist without my intervention it's an actually an exercise in power i am i may like the exercise of power and what the freedom it gives me but the freedom it gives to me is a liberation from the dictates of my own body and to some degree the creaturely existence that i've been given is it right to do that well those are moral and ethical questions i'm not going to deal with the specifics of them there They're, although in your bioethics classes you would get into all that stuff you would have to but he says this latter point is not always sufficiently emphasized is that on the screen there because those who write on social matters have not yet learned to imitate the physicians yes by almost by always including time among the dimensions in order to understand fully what man's power over nature and therefore the power of some men over other men really means we must picture the race extended in time from the date of its emergence to that of its extinction each generation exercises power over its successors and each in so far as it modifies the environment bequeathed to it and rebels against tradition resists and limits the power of its predecessors okay so if we no longer exist in a historic continuity with the christian church now the church universal historic and apostolic if we are in rebellion against the past and we are controlling the future what are we doing ourselves we're empowered we believe we're empowering ourselves but what is the self that we're empowering where's the common humanity between our parents and us and the future generations if we're not having children if we're in rebellion against the past even the closely proximate past and we're going to make all decisions for ourselves what sort of humanity are we building one in which we're empowered for sure but what are we gaining power over our own nature do we become less human in the process? Uh, I'm going to say yes and no. We can't deprive ourselves of our humanity because we bear the image of God, and you can't get rid of it. But yes, in the sense that you can more and more strongly rebel against that thing of which you are, which of which of whose identity you don't know because you didn't create it. Right? You're not the author of your own being neither are your parents by the way god is he's called the creator we can get into all that that sort of things but these are these are complex issues this modifies the picture which is sometimes painted of a progressive emancipation from tradition and a progressive control of natural processes resulting in a continual increase of human power. In reality, of course, if any one age really attains by eugenics and scientific education, the power to make its descendants what it pleases, all men who live after it are the patients of that power. You ever thought about that? Now you see mankind not as man, but as patient. And what is a patient? Go to the Latin root of it. It's somebody who suffers. We're going to make you into... You, we can gussy it up in whatever language we want. We can call it... You can self-identify. Right? You can call yourself what you want to. Yes, but you... I've made myself dependent on your scalpel, your injections, your treatments. 
ad infinitum. I'm a patient going forward. I'm no longer a human being made in the image of God. I've moved myself away from those categories. We, we make ourselves into a whole society of patients. Is it not an interesting argument? I mean, it's a, it's a potent argument. And as far as minorities and majorities, anybody who's native, which I have roots, anyone who's black, uh, any minority will recognize that the government has mistreated minorities in exactly what, now those are the identifiable, identifiable minorities. Every minority experiences this. It's just the will of the governing powers on those who may not even consent to it. That's what we get when we vote, by the way. There's to some degree you're giving yourself over to the government there. But what's the limit on the government's authority there? In the past uh, two years, I've heard appeals to Romans 13, which is that, you know, trust those in authority. That's not the only thing that scripture says about that subject, by the way. And in the context of this problem, I think it's at best naive. But look at this. In, if we attain this, all men who live after are patients of that power. They are weaker, not stronger. So if you're a patient, you are, not, you are in need of the physician. And the physicians are those in control. Well, those people are weaker and not stronger. So the outcome of this grab, this power grab, if you will, is a weaker humanity. So the human beings, which were going to be delivered by the scientific process of a humanistic science, is actually a weaker humanity. And fewer at that if you buy the logic of carbon footprints. It is a hostile act done out of fear in the name of empowerment. Isn't it extraordinary? Gives the exact opposite of what it purports to do. And if, as is almost certain, he says, the age which had thus attained maximum power over posterity were also the age most emancipated from tradition, it would be engaged in reducing the power of its predecessors almost as drastically as that of its successors. They would overthrow statues. They would desecrate memorials. They would overturn the names of universities. Let the reader understand. And we must also remember that quite apart from this, the later a generation comes, the nearer it lives to that date at which the species becomes extinct, the less power it will have in the forward direction because its subjects will be so few. There is therefore no question of a power vested in the race as a whole, steadily growing as long as the race survives. The last men, far from being the heirs of power, will be of all men most subject to the dead hand of the great planners and conditioners and will themselves exercise least power upon the future. I'm just, this is directly, this is C.S. Lewis. I've not added a word to it. Is he not talking about now? No, he's talking about his society. Is he not talking about the problem we face now? He absolutely is. And why is it? Well, because of the view of human nature. That's my, that's his statement. It's also my premise to the whole course. We need to recover a sense of human nature. And that recovery of the sense of human nature is gonna go with how do, does humanity relate to God? How does humanity relate to other human beings? How does it relate to the animals? How does it relate to the earth, etc.? Those things need to be recovered because those things are not discussed in seminaries. They're not discussed. They talk about the gospel. We're going to, uh, those are the good ones, by the way. The, the gospel, which is the free gift of grace, right? And, re, and the deliverance from sin and God's judgment on your sin, that's what seminaries teach. They will teach you to deal with the biblical text, and that's the centerpiece of it. But they won't talk about all these things, which are consequences of the conjunction of special grace to common grace. What do they have, what do those two phrases have in common? The word grace. Unless there's a continuity between the two, the word grace has no meaning. Do you have any comments or questions? I've spoken for about an hour here. I got 15 minutes. Do you have any comments or questions at this point? I like throwing it at you. Big wax. I can talk about this all day. Yes. That's clear.
answers and so forth? Yeah, I'm out of my area on yeah. this. But, but I, will, I will know what you all know, yeah. which is the prevalence, uh, because it's happened within our lifetimes. And when I say our, I mean you're mostly in your 20s, or teens even. But the growth in autoimmune disorders, for instance, your, your own body sort of fighting itself. Right? Those are observable, and, and things like um, you know, kids that are autistic, you know, I realize there's a spectrum, but really genuinely autistic. Those are observable things in within a couple of generations. So what's happening there? I, I don't know the answer to it. I just simply, I do observe it. And um, I have my conjecture, but I don't want to present my conjecture in lectures as if I know, because I don't know, but I do observe that. That is happening. Part of it could be explained, but not to my mind sufficiently, by the simple principle that human nature uh, gets worse over time, not morally, but biologically, it degenerates. There are copying errors in, in procreation. In general, it, people don't get better and better and stronger and stronger, it's the exact opposite. Uh, there, are, there are copying mistakes that take place at the genetic level such that people um, start to develop diseases and so forth. This is one of the reasons why um, you're prohibited from incest, among other things. Or you have to marry a certain distance outside your immediate family because the, the error that you have in one person which is not expressed, I'm using modern scientific language, the old world wouldn't under, understood it this way. If you, if you replicate with somebody very close in your family line, that then gets expressed in some sort of fatal, sometimes weakness or genetic or abnormality, et cetera, et cetera. So it actually helps to be marry more distant from your genetic makeup in some ways. So that's just a biological thing, but that's a slow thing. I don't think it results in sudden changes of the sort that result in what we're talking about here, or what I just mentioned, which is uh, you know, autoimmune disorders. And those are really common now before COVID. I mean, somebody, some people say COVID causes those, some people say the shots cause those. Whatever, you see them before the shots, but you don't see them perhaps before mass inoculations. So, so that's one hypothesis. I don't know what to think about it. I don't know enough to, to think about it, but some, this is the, people are concerned about mass vaccinations and the effect of mass vaccinations. And there, there's, there's not a lot of sense in, in that either, to some degree. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm vaccinated myself. I had all the vaccines growing up. It's just like, that's what you do. I get my kids shot. You know, they got the polio, whatever. I don't even know what they got, but yeah. But I know people that don't, and they're worried about these sorts of things that they're seeing. And, and I was like, I, well, there's a logic to that. I don't know. And I don't really trust the scientists entirely to say that it's safe. When they say that it's safe, I've sort of lost trust that their assurance that it's safe is as credible as I once would have thought it as. And I was the one who warned them, don't do this because it's going to destroy your credibility. And it's not because I have no trust in it, but it's hard to trust when it's that. that's the case. Um, So what we see is a new order, the scientists that have quasi-spiritual power invested in them, they're going to save us. Um, and a caste of priest kings uh, mediated through technology. And the AI scores and so forth. That's how these um, outbreaks are predicted, by computer algorithms. So the enormous inflation failure at the outset of COVID was just simply a miscalculation, unless you think that it was intentional. But there was a huge miscalculation earlier on from the University of London that set off the spiral of terror. This is going to be mass deaths on a scale that, and so everyone's in lockdown, lockdown, and then a few weeks later, oops, I got the, you know, a rounding error. <laughs> Instead of millions, it's hundreds of thousands. Okay, but that's what we're talking about in flu season. That's not 
the catastrophic, catastrophic outcome that you were talking about a few minutes ago. But, but think about the, the vagaries that rise, arise out of this. What, like think about being on social media. What does it mean to violate so, uh, community standards? What community? What standards? Nobody knows. Why can you, uh, you know, what, what are the criteria for describing something as misinformation? I, I think there is misinformation. It's called propaganda. But again, Lewis is arguing there is a distinction between propaganda and education that's con connected with our human nature. But if we ignore our human nature, then it's invariably propaganda. Is that not what's happening here? So you have to have a sense of what truth is and what human nature is in order to determine whether it is those things. But if you throw that out the window in the name of environmentalism, which is post-humanism, then you've got serious problems. Um, more contemporary illustration. If you tried to post something about vaccinations on social media, you would get flagged and it wouldn't appear. But if you posted it with the word inoculation, it would. What's the difference between vaccination and, and inoculation? There's no difference, by the way, pretty much, other than the semantics of the word. But it's still a shot, right? But it gets flagged up for that. I'm just saying there's something essentially arbitrary about the whole policing of it. And it's not just going to be rectified by that. It's just we don't want certain things to be said because it creates suspicion, whatever. I think the overreach causes suspicion myself. As soon as you quarantine healthy people, you've gone against medical practice for um, millennia, against what scripture says about treating the sick, and what modern science said about quarantining people up until 2020. When you come to AI, then you, distinct, you, don't, you lose the distinction between actuality and simulation, between virtual reality and the reality. Many of you I taught through uh, Zoom. That was the classroom. I could see your faces if you turned on your screens, which most of you didn't. And I don't blame you for it, to be honest. I don't like looking at myself either. I, can't, I don't have that option myself, being a, you know, the voice behind the dark screen, whatever. But. Um, who wants to look at themselves on the screen all the time? I didn't. It has a certain effect on you as well, but um, it became the means, the palantir to connect everyone together. Was that infallible? Did it, did it not result in a dehumanization of some sort? I think it did. How could I put my finger on it? I, I could give reasons, but they wouldn't be sufficient. They'd be just like, well, that's your feeling. That it was nothing was lost. I think something was lost. Uh, many people didn't go back to church or back to school, like as in university, because they felt betrayed. And I'm not going back to that. There was something at stake there, and you didn't recognize it, and I'm not, I'm not doing that again. I've heard people say that, or, uh, but I've heard fewer than are represented by the people that just stopped talking and just did it. I'm, I'm out. Oops. Losing my marbles. But Lewis is, is, is putting his finger on it, and now here's the problem here. To some, it will appear, since I have a few minutes in here, no other question. The, the, first of all, the conditioners are going to choose an artificial tau. They're going to come up with a new rule of what the law of human nature is. Right? They're going to come up with a new humanity and what the rules are for that. And what are the rules going to be? Well, you don't have to look very far. It's diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay? What are those rules? What, what do they conform to? Do they conform to theism or do they conform to pantheism? I'm telling you right now where I stand. Pantheism. This is pantheism. Because you, you're including, if you include everything, then you're including things that are right and wrong. I'm not even saying what the right and wrong is, but if you include everything, and if you say diversity, what does diversity even mean? What does inclusion even mean? What does equity even mean? You're effectively removing every possible distinction as an objection. That's just pantheism. He's, Lewis will talk about that in mere Christianity and the implications of that. But that so that will be the new Tao, the new law of human nature, which is presented as a law. By the way, you're gonna have to conform to this law. 
going forward because otherwise you're dehumanizing people. Of course, there's, a, there's an inexorable logic there and it makes perfect sense. The only thing that doesn't make sense is the question of whether what they say the Tao is, is actually the Tao or is human nature. Or are the things that we can do that violate human nature? If there aren't, then we can't appeal to justice anymore. Because every time somebody wrongs us, we appeal that they did something unjust. That's something outside of human nature. That's contradicting human nature, but it's going to run into the problems of diversity, equity, inclusion, where those distinctions don't exist anymore, except in groups. Uh, pantheism, by the way, is characteristic of cultures in which they have a caste system, like Hinduism. And then they have identity groups, and they are in a very strict hierarchy and an unbreakable hierarchy at that. So now we get something that's entirely amenable to the conditioners, something where they will be in charge of how human nature is rightly adjudicated, and they determine it. And we fall into line on it, and they will do it in accordance with certain characteristics. I said that I'm a native, I am. Do I look like a native? No. I answered for you so you wouldn't have to say, and I wouldn't have to blame you for being racist. I have blue eyes. My genes are, are, are oppressing the native part. You know, the whiteness in me is oppressing the native, uh, whatever. You get the point. So on a hierarchy, I'm, I'm, I'm no longer at the bottom. I'm to be elevated to, to deal with the problem of the oppression. Does it actually deal with the problem of the oppression? I just think it creates new oppressors while not dealing with the injustice done, done to a person. It's, so it's just arbitrary, it appears scientific, it's definitely bureaucratic, and does it solve the problem of humanity anyway? I think it just creates new problems But the old situation, oh, I like this. Second difference is more important, he says. Where is this? I need to come to this. Where is it? I'm not sure I'm going to find it here. Well, I'm just going to read it to you. In the older systems, both the kind of man the teachers wish to produce and their motives for producing him were prescribed by the Tao, a norm to which the teachers themselves were subject and from which they claimed no liberty to depart. They did not cut men to some pattern they had chosen. They handed on what they had received. They handed or initiated the young neophyte into the mystery of humanity, which overarched him and them alike. We belong to this common category of, huma of humanity. It was but old birds teaching young birds to fly. This will be changed. Values are now mere natural phenomena. Judgments of value are to be produced in the pupil as part of the conditioning. Whatever Tao there is will be the product, not the motive of, educated, of education. It'll be the outcome. It'll be our values. They'll be expressed. It won't be the motive. It will be the product. The conditioners have been emancipated from all that. It is one part of nature which they have conquered. That is their moral nature. The ultimate springs of human action are longer for them something given. They have surrendered like electricity. It is the function of the conditioners to control, not to obey them. So in other words, they can be hypocrites. They can say, you should do that, but I don't have to do that because I know best and I'm a scientist. And I know what's best for you because I determine what the Tao is. They know how to produce conscience and decide what kind of conscience they will produce. They themselves are outside, above. They're outside human nature. They think that they can jump over the shadow because it's not their shadow, it's just there. It's not, they're not connected to that shadow which they're studying. There's no common humanity anymore. They divide the humanities up. This is the human sciences at work. For we are assuming the last stage of man's struggle with nature, the final victory has been won, human nature has been conquered, and of course, has conquered in whatever sense those words may now bear. Uh, you can read the whole of the chapter. I'm 
at the conclusion of this, but you can see where he is pointing with this. This is not a small topic. It is one that is intensely involved. Let me say one final thing. In 1970 or 1971, there was a determinist psychologist, behaviorist psychologist by the name of B.F. Skinner. You heard of B.F. Skinner. He believed in psychological conditioning. He called C.S. Lewis the last guardian, and I'm gonna forget the phrase here, I am gonna forget the phrase, of nobility and virtue, something like that. And he's, the, he's, he's safeguarding a sense of the humanities, and he's their best exponent, and he wrote against us, and it's in the title of the, I'll come to it next time, I'll, I, I'm annoyed that I've forgotten it. But he wrote directly against Lewis's view of human nature as a behavior scientist and said that sense of humanity has to go. And it did go. They conditioned it out, and Lewis passed on. Now, I think that his argument has not passed on. It's still with us. But the, the battle uh, that Lewis waged and was waged in, I think, the world wars was against an ideology. The ideology was there in Britain. It was there in the United States. It was there in Canada. It is still there. It's the battle that we're all in. Anyway, I'm done for now. I'll see you next time.